Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Geek Warning from the Escape Collective. I'm James Huang. I am joined today, as usual, by Escape Collective technical editor, Dave Rome. However, Dave is not in Sydney, Australia. Dave's actually sitting right next to me here in a hotel room in Portland, Oregon. Dave, what are we doing here? Uh, having some ice cream. And then tomorrow begins Made, uh, the inaugural custom handmade bike show of Portland, which I think is uh, fair to say the replacement of the of NABs. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, COVID was not very kind to the North American Handmade Bicycle Show. Uh, after a couple of postponements and cancellations, it unfortunately just kind of went away. Uh, and Made has now just sort of picked up where that show left off. Uh, there's a whole bunch of builders here, uh, seemingly a whole bunch of media here, hopefully a whole bunch of attendees, I hope, because I would love to see this show be very healthy and continue on for a number of years. Uh, I'm definitely excited to go check it out. It's been a while since I've been to a really good handmade bicycle show. Uh, and Dave, I think you feel the same, but it always seems like going to one of those shows is kind of one way I kind of get reinvigorated about bikes again. Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, typically... Everyone there is for the passion of it, and uh, very few people are, are getting rich off of what they do. It's it's really the craft and the art and the the idea of making something yourself that that brings everyone together. So for me, it's uh, yeah, I feel exactly the same way. It um, creates a spark for me. Well, um, by the time you hear this podcast. We will have already checked out day one of the Made Show. Uh, and make sure you head over to escapecollective.com to check out what we are going to have. Uh, well, we're going to have a whole bunch of galleries from the show. Uh, I don't really know how many we're going to have, but guessing that we're – More than that, three. See, well, I was going to say, seeing as how there are two of us here uh, and an awful lot of bikes that we're going to want to show you, there – I mean, I'm going to guess we're going to have at least a week's worth of coverage, perhaps more. Mm. So – Let's let's just hope uh, we don't go as over the top as you might have at, at Eurobike. I went pretty over the top at Eurobike. Yeah. Felt good, though. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, head over to the site, check it out. We'll have lots of really cool bikes to show you. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, today we do have an awful lot of news to talk about. Um, so I think, uh, well, Dave, it's, it's getting pretty late here, and we're just going to go ahead and dive into the news. Uh, mm -hmm. First thing that I want to talk about, um, back at Eurobike, I talked about... Uh, the company Driven is sort of the uh, kind of like a offshoot of ceramic speed, I guess. Um, they showed off a combination gearbox slash e-bike system, uh, and apparently they've now gone into crowdfunding mode. Uh, Dave, what did you find out about this? It's a very good question. Uh, yeah, basically they're they're offering uh, equity in the company at the moment, so it's uh, early days. Only just uh, they only just released this campaign, but yeah, basically they're they're looking to go to market with this e-bike system, and and to do that, you can uh, you can buy yourself a stake in the company. Uh, the transmission setup that they have is pretty interesting. They essentially have derived it from uh, a continuously variable transmission out of a Toyota, um, and uh, it's the sort of thing that is definitely much much easier to show you in pictures and video than on a podcast. So, uh, Dave, do we have a, a URL or something that we can point people to for this driven thing? Uh, yes, their own website is madebydriven.com. Uh, definitely don't go to drivenbikes.com, which I, I just did. And, uh, it is not the same company. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, wefunder.com forward slash driven is, uh, is where their equity raising campaign can be found. Mm, well, and then you can go check out a neat little video for how the whole thing works. Uh, the system does seem to have a lot of promise. I am curious to see how well this thing does and see if they have any backers, but, uh, we'll find out soon enough. Um, another thing that popped up over just the last 24 hours, I think, that uh, I think is going to be far more controversial uh, and definitely not something that I expected. Um, so our former colleague, uh, Ben Delaney. So Dave and I used to work with Ben uh, when we all were at uh, Bike Radar. Uh, and he was over at a gravel event. Uh, I think, was it Steamboat Gravel that he was at? Uh, and he... Stumbled upon a very large wheel on a Moot's bicycle. Yeah. Not not the largest wheel we've seen. I mean there's thirty sixes out there. This is this is a new a new size just to mess with people. It's apparently called seven fifty D. right now it's a project between Moots and WTB, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And potentially infringing on a Canon uh trademark because they have a camera under that model name. 
Oh, you mm. are right. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, it's anyway, a wheel size and it's, not it's a not a not a DSLR. Yeah, so trademarks. Probably, anyway, probably uh, yeah, getting away from it being a different so, industry and all. So we already have 700C, obviously, and 750D. Essentially, you can think of it as uh, a gravel sized tire in terms of width and kind of casing section volume except the overall diameter is closer to that of a two niner mountain bike wheel and tire uh dave what are the purported advantages of this sort of thing uh better rollover really uh that's the the main one which is kind of the whole initial selling pitch when mountain bikes went to larger wheels versus the original 26 in, 26 inch size and yeah i mean they're claiming that you get the better rollover and rolling speed of a of a larger wheel without the the added weight of having to drag around a big a big twenty nine er tire. I um, mean, yeah, this seven fifty D setup, as compared to an otherwise equivalent seven hundred C setup, would obviously be heavier. Would obviously have more inertia. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, to be fair, these are similar arguments that people had when twenty nine came out and people were still on twenty six. Uh, there was all sorts of, you know, people throwing their arms up in the air, like, you know, we don't need another wheel size, so on and so forth. And we kind of see what happened there. I mean, 29 took over essentially for mountain bike. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is very early days. It's ba- basically been barely 24 hours since this thing broke ground. Mm. Um, do and we it have, broke the internet. <laughs> it seemingly broke the bicycle internet yeah. anyway. Uh, yeah. Do we have any sense whatsoever as to how people feel about this? Uh, I'd, I'd say it's it's safe to say that everyone's united around it and has found something to to hate together. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I think to to Moots's credit, I mean they're not they're not claiming it to be a revolutionary new thing that's going to change the cycling world. They're they're just experimenting with it, and uh, from from what I've seen through through Ben Delaney's coverage of it, is Moots are kind of pitching it as maybe the answer to really tall people where a larger wheel makes more sense. Um, so yeah, hopefully it it stays as a, a niche thing like that. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I personally am, am skeptical of the need for it, given that we've got lightweight 29 tires that get you to the same overall diameter. But, uh, but yeah, I mean the, I'm not six foot plus I'm, I'm just a, a short person. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about short, but not particularly, uh, vertically gifted no no <laughs> no very average in height yes yeah yeah so anyway uh, again this is something that we don't really have a whole lot of information on just broke just broke cover a little bit ago uh we will be keeping an eye on this one for sure um i'm kind of curious to ride one mm. but i also don't really want it to be successful either because i just don't we have this it's like the one bit of stability that we have right now in the bicycle industry, like sure. gravel wheel diameter. Like, yeah. And, you know, like that increased diameter, I mean, surely you want to increase the bracing angles of those spokes. So you'd probably want to make that boost spacing, uh, 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 which would, you know, uh, then you need to match the chain line on that. So we need to increase the Q oh factor. Oh, God. Anyway, uh, I'm, now, uh, I'm yeah. now just giving the bike yeah. industry problems to problems to solve that we all don't want solved. But, uh, yeah, I, I do think that we're in a, pretty good place where tire technology has has finally gotten to a point where we're actually getting really good selections of 700 c gravel tires and i don't think this is going to disrupt that but uh yeah i don't know um i think we'll see wtb you know they they were there at the beginning of the 29er wheel as well you know they they helped create the 29er wheel they they helped to produce some of the earliest tires there that, that allowed the X, um that size to be experimented with and I think that's all this is. It's an experiment, and we'll see if it goes anywhere. Uh, and interestingly enough, if I saw correctly, WTB actually is launching this 750D setup with the same tire model that it used to launch two niners back in the day, too. It's a Nano Raptor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For those of you who were alive back then, which I very much was. All right. In in more conventional news, uh, Trek just today. I, yeah, just today. Uh, by the time you were listening to this, uh, we have a new Madone SL to go along with the higher end Madone SLR aero road bike that they launched a little while ago. Uh, the one with the hole in the seat tube. The one with if the hole in the seat tube. Not sure which yes, bike it is. That's the one. Um, 
No real surprises here. It very much follows the trend of previous Trek kind of second tier bike launches. Uh, it is the it might actually be the same frame molds that they use for the Madone SLR. Sounds like it. Um, but the main changes are they use a what they're calling a 500 series OCLV carbon. So it's basically just a heavier and less complicated carbon layup, uh, kind of not quite as light materials. Uh, and it uses a two-piece cockpit instead of the one-piece setup that the Madone SLR uses. Um, it is electronic only, so no mechanical drivetrains. Um, it's available as a frame set or a complete bike, uh, several models of complete bikes, in fact. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, when you buy the frame set, there's no seat post included because they de- determined that to be a wear I- or a fit item. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's strange for a, a bike that requires its own seat post. I mean, it, it's not like they don't make the seat post available. They're just not including it. So yeah, fair enough. Um, but uh, I actually have one of these bikes on hand right now and unfortunately just didn't have enough time to get it all set up and get enough test time on it to to get a review done but that'll be coming pretty soon is it still in its box james it's not still in its box oh, okay all right <laughs> that's further than i thought okay <laughs> i did get that far um but i'm not done with it so that review will be coming sooner than later hopefully but uh, i don't expect any big surprises here though because um again it, it's it's basically just a heavier slr so um uh, yeah. have they announced how much heavier it is than the slr uh, I don't remember off the top of my head how much the SLR frame supposedly weighs, but uh, I do have official figures for the new Madone SL. Mm. Uh, Trek is saying that a 56 centimeter frame only painted is 1,200 grams for for 56. Sounds high. It does sound kind of high, quite high actually. Mm. And then uh, 476 grams for the matching fork only painted. And then for the two models that they have right now, the Madone SL6 and the Madone SL7, um, that is a – again, for a 56 centimeter, we're looking at 8 kilos even uh, for or 17.64 pounds. And then for the Madone SL6, we're looking at 8.4 kilos or 18.5 pounds. So uh, these are not light bikes, um, but I would say previous generations of the Madone have not necessarily been light either. So uh, kind of continuing on with the theme here. So – Trek is clearly making the case that aero matters more than weight. Yeah, I'm looking uh, under a thousand grams for the SLR. Don't have a specific weight in front of me, but yeah, I mean that's a couple hundred grams, a few hundred grams more, couple yeah. hundred grams plus. I guess it's it's a not insignificant difference. Yeah, um, but. Uh, for sure, if someone's looking for a weight weenie bike, they're probably not shopping for a Madone anyway. No. And uh, the other figure that Trek has provided is they, they're claiming they've saved about 300 grams from the previous Madone SL. Which isn't surprising considering as yeah. speedy as that Madone SL was before, mm. that thing was heavy. Yeah. Uh, any word on pricing? Uh, I do have pricing, actually. So bare frame set, we're looking at 4000 US. Uh, looks like it's not available in Australia. There's no price listed for that. Mm. Uh, looking at about 4000 4, euros and then 3750 British pounds. Uh, kind of expensive. Uh, Madone SL6 for a complete bike, we're looking at 5500 US, 8300 Australian uh, then we were looking at about 6,000 euros and 5,625 British pounds. And then, uh, finally the SL7, 6,500 US, 10,300 Australian, 8,000 euros and 7,500 pounds. Uh, any idea what parts are on that? Uh, as a matter of fact, I do. Yeah. So the SL6, uh, we are looking at, uh, Bond Trigger AOLS Elite 50 OCLV carbon wheels, so 50 mil uh, carbon clinchers, uh, Shimano 105 Di2, and then the other bike, the SL7, that bike is going to come with Shimano Altegra Di2, and then Bond Trigger AOLS Pro 51 uh, carbon clincher wheels, uh, and then again, two-piece two piece, uh, two piece cockpits. Um, it, it feels to me like the pricing may be less ridiculous than what we complained about of the Demane a year ago. It might be. I mean, yeah. I'd have to, com- I'd have to pull up some old prices to compare. I, well, I vaguely recall like the 105 DI2 bike being more in line with where that SL7 is now. 
I vaguely recall being more offended yeah. by pricing before. So yeah. we have mentioned in the past that – Maybe we've just been beaten down by the uh, industry to accept the prices. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, I do recall that in the past we had talked about how – uh, the way things have shifted with supply and demand after the kind of post COVID crash now with the way the bicycle, the bike sales are going. Um, we had been speculating that maybe prices were going to start swinging in the other, other direction. And again, we'd have to check pricing to make sure that is actually the case. But yeah, this, I mean, these prices are still high, but they're seemingly not quite as offensively high. Yeah. So that would say, I would say that is, I don't know. It, it's again, Less offensive because at least in the U.S. anyway, $6,500 for a properly aero bike with Altegra DI2 and some decent aero carbon wheels. Yeah, I mean, the bike is heavy. Yeah. Um, but if aero is what you're after, all things considered, 60, 6500 bucks could be worse. Yeah. So anyway, like I and said. And you get a hole in the seat tube. And you get a hole in the seat tube. So anyway, like I said, I've got one on hand. Uh, hopefully we'll have that review wrapped up sooner than later. Um, yeah, stay tuned on that one. Um, next bit of news that we have here, it comes from Wolf Tooth, Wolf Tooth Components, a uh, popular component brand out of Minnesota. Um, some drivetrain developments here, specifically with chain rings. Dave, what do we have here? Yeah, uh, they, they've they increased their range, uh, widened their range, broadened their range of uh, transmission compatible chain rings. So that's SRAM's new 12-speed Eagle wireless drivetrain, the, the one that requires a uh, a universal derailleur hanger frame for the, the rear derailleur mounting. Uh, and yes, uh, they've, uh, Wolf Tooth have got a bunch of chain rings. So uh, they've they've released one for Race Face Cinch. Uh, so for Race Face and Eastern Cranks that use that mul- uh, mounting pattern, uh, these chain rings, yeah, optimize for the SRAM chain, but most importantly, they, they also shift the chain line to a 55 millimeter chain line versus a, I guess, the standard 52 millimeter chain line, which is quite a neat little feature. So you can, if you've got some nice race face cranks already on a bike, uh, you, you're you basically, yeah, a chain ring away from using them on, on New Eagle. Well, and one thing that I like about that sort of setup is uh, one thing I've noticed with the stock SRAM Eagle cranks is that the Q factor also seems to be wider there. Yes. Um, With exception to one, if you go the XX1, sorry, not the XX, the XXSL version. Sorry, it's it's late for me here. Uh, the XXSL in the narrow Q factor, there is an option. But yeah, otherwise, you're, you're stuck with a pretty wide Q factor. Right. But with this different aftermarket chain ring setups, uh, that should, at least in theory, let you run your current crank arms and your current comfortable Q factor, if that's what you like. Yep. And then you can go with a wider chain line to use your SRAM transmission stuff. Yep. Uh, sticking on that theme, they've also, uh, Wolf Tooth have released a, a wide range of, of chain rings, again, for transmission, but to fit older SRAM uh, cranks that use a three-bolt mounting pattern for the chain ring. Uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah, basically anything from previous Eagle and before. Uh, three-bolt SRAM cranks, you mean? What no, did I say? You said Shimano. Did I really? You did. Oh my goodness, it is late. <laughs> very, very late, apparently. Yes. Uh, we're in Oregon. I am on Detroit time, which is three hours ahead. Uh, it is it is midnight in my head right now, so I apologize for, for, for getting two major competing brands mixed up. And that giant scoop of ice cream you had from, what was the place called? Cosmic Bliss? Yeah, that was very nice. Yeah. Uh, it was, it, a lot of sugar, and Dave, I'm pretty sure you're starting to get your sugar crash now. Oh, dear. So we better get moving here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dave, what else is new from Wolf Tooth? They've got a new fork, uh, the Lithic fork. So a oh, Lithic brand, uh, which is the They've fork. They've had that for a little while. Yeah, you, it's the, the fork you find on uh, their Otso brand of bikes. Uh, and yeah, new carbon fiber fork with... Uh, all the features that you'd expect of such an adventure style fork. Uh, it's, it seems to be a pretty universal, universal fork, which uh, I'm talking around the details cause I don't know them. Um, <laughs> Dave, I kind of wondered if listeners can pick up some sort of a, a slight shift in the level of polish from our usual shows. Yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. There we go. They've added, uh, so yeah, you can now aftermarket buy their mountain fork, which uh, has been available on their own Otso bikes for for some time now, but uh, now it's available as an aftermarket product. And yeah, I mean, it's it's basically a, a rigid carbon fiber fork for mountain bikes and bikepacking style bikes. Suspension corrected. Who would you say is the customer for something like this? I think most people getting this fork are really building up the sort of... Uh, 
big tired mountain style bikepacking bikes. So would you say that they're like this is more likely to be a fork option for someone who is building up a custom bike or at least a bike from sort of like frame up perhaps? Yes, definitely. Uh, otherwise, anyone maybe that's got like a, a hardtail 29er or, or similar that's wanting to turn it into a bikepacking bike uh, would be another option. So swap out the suspension fork and put one of these in place. Um, yeah, Wolf Tooth certainly aren't the only ones to offer such a fork, but uh, it's always nice to have more options. Hmm. Interesting. All right, then. Well, uh, I, I think we, well, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually saw one of these forks on a bike here at Made. While we're here this week, mm. dare I say, with Wolf Tooth present, we will see one of these folks. Well, definitely at their booth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last bit of news before we move on to what's on our minds this week. Uh, there is a little, I think it's a Dutch company uh, called Leap Components. Uh, they specialized in a whole bunch of 3D printed stuff. Uh, I actually have some aftermarket um, access kind of the 3D printed paddles that uh, just showed up from them. I'm so, jealous. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try them out. Mm. I'm very very curious to try them out because I've been less than completely satisfied with the range of stock SRAM axis mountain bike shifter uh, options that are out there right now. But yeah, uh, anyway, I, I feel like I'm Goldie I'm I feel like I'm Goldilocks of the in a world of SRAM axis shifters uh and I I've yet to find the the middle option. Hmm. I see. Mm. Yeah. Well, I will. I will let you know how these go. Okay. In fact, I will let everyone know how how these go once I have them installed and I have a chance to try them out. Um, but uh, Leap's got a pretty interesting, diver- uh, interesting, diverse set of products right now. So they do have a whole bunch of like shifter mounts and kind of like aftermarket paddles for like the axis dropper and stuff like that. Um, they have sort of a. Uh, uh, like inboard mounts that you can use for blip buttons uh, in case you want to kind of go with like a more left-right sequential setup on your mountain bike. That's actually kind of neat. Um, but another thing that they have that is, well, might be of particular interest to people who have been running Eagle Axis rear derailers for quite a while uh, and may have noticed maybe your pivots not quite being as tight and play-free as they used to be, they now have an, a SRAM Axis derailleur bushing repair kit um, that is designed to... Well, this is, I should point out, this is not a SRAM approved thing in any way um, because there is some surgery required here. Um, but uh, if you notice that your older SRAM Axis mountain bike rear derailers, again, are a little bit sloppy, uh, you can buy one of these kits and presume, well, and apparently just sort of replace all these bushings that are in there for not a whole lot of money, actually, because if you go with the full setup, uh, that with all the bushings, all the retaining rings and bolts and all the other stuff, and with a tool too, and even with the drill bit, uh, this costs you $83 US. Uh, I'm not sure what it would be in other currencies. Um, but that strikes me as being not so bad if all the other components, all, all the other parts on that rear derailleur are in good shape. Uh, if that's all it takes for you to kind of get everything together and replace all mm. those pivots and make it nice and tidy in, the fact that it comes with a drill bit makes me think uh, it's either eighty three dollars US or four hundred and fifty dollars for a new derailleur once you screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very steady hands, very 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 steady hands, please. Yeah. Uh, on that topic, um, this is probably uh, a statement that's going to get me in great trouble. Uh, but SRAM has those derailers. Uh, there's a lot on the market and a lot out there that actually have uh, like three. There's, there's, uh, you look at the parallelogram and there's, there's four points of the bushings. Uh, and one of those points has no reinforcement to it. There's just like an empty thread. Uh, and there's basically, you can get yourself, I can't remember the size of the bolt. I'd like to say it's an M3 and you can fasten an M3 bolt into this. And it actually adds some security and rigidity to the, that parallelogram that actually prevents the derailleur from getting this play. Yeah, uh, and I, I have no idea. I've never, I've never actually got to the bottom of why SRAM was shipping the derailleur out without a bolt in place. But the latest versions now come with a bolt in this empty hole. But I've certainly owned a derailleur with nothing in there, and I've seen plenty of others come out of the box with nothing in there. Uh, yeah, there was someone. I think it was maybe a MTBR.com or a Pink Bike Forum comment where someone kind of realized this and gave the bolt dimensions and I have done that exact thing. And I now, anytime a friend has one of those derailers, I fill the bolt hole. And, uh, I think I've heard similar from, uh, Brad Copeland as well, as far as realizing this. Um, 
it's a thing. And yeah, it seems to it it's that bolt isn't doesn't do anything when the derail is new, but as soon as there's some play in the pivots, it, it certainly uh yeah helps hold it all together. Ah, uh, that is fascinating. Kinda wanna find an old derailleur now. <laughs> do you want me to do you want me to find the link for you to should I should I actually find out what the uh no, because I can see it here now. Yeah, it's in the it's in the expanded drawing for this leap components pushing uh schematic here. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very intriguing. All right then. Anyway, uh as mm-hmm. I mentioned, if you have a sloppy SRAM axis eagle rear derailleur and you want to bring it back to life, go ahead and check out leapcomponents.com. So pretty interesting. I'll check it out. Uh anyway, that does it for the news segment of this week's show. Uh Dave, I'm kind of curious to see if you've got anything on your mind this week. Uh, not really. No. Um, your mind is blank. Yeah, I had a I had a week off of, from bikes, so I will I will uh, maybe see if I can add anything to yours. Uh, well, yeah, I actually do have something on my mind. So Canyon recently announced two new versions of their Endurace, the Endurace CF SLX and the Endurace CFR. Uh, and both of those bikes come with a version of their, uh, what is it, the CP0018 aero cockpit, I think is what the one it is. It's the same cockpit that comes on the uh, Ultimate and Aero now. So that's kind of shared between all three platforms. Uh, it's a three piece design. It has this kind of like hammerhead section, this sort of call it. And then they have uh, two hooks for the drops. Uh, one neat aspect is it does have adjustable width. Uh, it does not have adjustable length, however, uh, and Canyon, unfortunately, does not offer the option to specify your stem length for a bike like this, nor do they actually offer that thing aftermarket, which is also kind of odd. Really? Um, so if you need a different stem length, you'd... It might be something that you can arrange like by calling them or something, but if you go on the website, it's not offered, and I, I did contact them about it, and they said it's like not really officially offered. Um, so it is so strange. It, it is. And one thing that kind of bugs me is that the Endurace is their endurance road bike. And it is supposed to be a bike that is kind of like their mass appeal road bike. Yeah. Um, and I would say for a lot of those people, fit is going to be pretty important. So, um, the bike itself, I was pretty happy with it overall. Uh, it does have some quirks, uh, that cockpit, although it's, it's very nice and clean, the cabling is all hidden and everything. It does ride quite stiff if you travel with your bike. The fact that the that the bar kind of separates like that actually makes it pretty easy for packing because it kind of breaks down in width pretty much immediately. Um, but the fact that you can't tune the cockpit length is troubling. Uh, and I will say I'm not the only person to feel this way. So Matt Phillips over at Bicycling, he actually wrote a whole column about how this sort of industry-wide move toward a lot more integration is just sort of an unneeded headache for a lot of people, especially from mainstream customers. And I got to say, I'm with him on this. Yeah, that that column from Matt kind of struck me as perhaps uh, one of the first times he's actually had to pull these one of these bikes apart to individual pieces, and and has now realized how much of a pain it is maybe i'm maybe i'm misreading that i mean i think he's done it before but maybe he's maybe it kind of I just think like canyon pushed raises over the, the edge. level as far as how complex and how intricate their system is um it's pretty it's pretty different to anything else out there so i don't doubt that you know i think he said he spent three hours changing out the the bar and i don't doubt it well it's kind of funny because i i I think people who follow Matt on Instagram, his handle is slant, pal- slant parallelogram, if I remember correctly. Um, but he basically sort of documented this whole process in, almost in real time, essentially. And he went through all the levels of disassembly that had to go th- that he had to go through. You know, removing the brake hoses, removing the, removing the levers, uh, cutting off the ends of the brake hose so you could remove the uh, the, the 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 nut that you secure to secure the hose to the lever. And then having to refit an olive and barb and kind of restringing all the hoses and everything. And then the icing on the cake for him, he discovered that uh, Canyon doesn't use the same cross section of uh, hook inserts like for the for the, for the two ends. Yeah, the drops. Uh, yeah. So the, the that, that hammerhead section has different section depths depending on how long it is. So he turned he found out later uh, he needed a longer stem. And that longer stem also came with a larger cross-section for the hooks. And then when he went to bolt those things in, he found out that they 
technically fit, but they weren't quite right, certainly aesthetically, and it wasn't quite right in terms of like kind of how it fit in your hands. And then at that point, he had pretty much had everything all hooked up and he was just kind of like, nope, I'm done. And I think at that point, it really just pushed him over the edge to write the column. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, and he's completely right. I mean, this is, I, I, I don't think a bike like the Endurance needs that cockpit. I think it would actually really benefit from a more traditional cockpit uh, and perhaps taking uh, the BMC or specialized or whatever you want to call it style of cable routing where you just have it, have the, the hoses neatly, neatly guided beneath the stem, um, which allows for more customization. Cause yeah, I mean the Endurace absolutely needs that customer should be going to a bike fitter and most bike fitters are probably going to put that customer more upright than they think they need to be. Yeah. And then for that bike, with that cockpit set up, it, I mean, Canyon makes a big deal about how you have 15, mil, 15 millimeters of height adjustment. However, that's all you get. 15 millimeters really isn't that much, particularly mm-hmm. if you are uh, kind of a more casual rider that might need a lot more. Uh, and it's worth noting that there are no aftermarket options for that front end. It's a completely proprietary setup. You can't just use any sort of bar and stem that's out on the market. Um uh, again, I'm, I'm a little surprised, uh, mainly because previously with other older generations of the Endures and Ultimate and Aeroad and stuff, um, Canyon did have one-piece cockpits for all those, but they were dedicated one-piece cockpits for the different platforms. Uh, and it's interesting that they're using this CP0018 Aero cockpit set up identically across all three families, the Aero, the Ultimate, and the Endures. Um, I'm not really sure why that is, because it would seem that it would seem that Canyon would have the resources to do kind of dedicated setups for each family, but I'm sure they have some reason behind it that hopefully extends to something more than just cost cutting. Um, but either way, yeah, it just doesn't seem like quite something that I would love to see or that I like to see on a bike like the Endurance. Most importantly for me, I think there's no longer, there's not enough separation between the Endurance and the, the Ultimate anymore for me. Like, I mean, yes, the geometry, fit, for sure. the geometry differs, but just... Being locked into that cockpit, I think, is is going to be such a defining feature for so many people. Uh, and for me, I, I'm kind of disappointed by it because the Endurance for, for the last four plus years has been a model of bike that I've actually strongly recommended to people when the when the fit was appropriate. Uh, and I, I just don't see myself recommending that bike anymore. Yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit of a head scratcher for me uh, because again. There was a lot on that bike that I really liked. Uh, it's been a very, very popular bike for Canyon. I'm sure they have sold an absolute ton of them. Uh, in fact, I'm sure that they're still going to sell a whole lot of these because the sad thing is on paper, it does look better. It's a very clean looking setup. It's tidy. It looks sleek. Um, but if it doesn't fit, you're kind of just hosed. Yeah. Uh, I I briefly was testing uh, what came out last year, the Endurace CF which is their entry level carbon fiber version of this bike which which was unusually launched well in advance of these higher end versions uh and basically they they kept the bike much the same as before it had a two piece cockpit um but they'd redone the geometry to make it far more relaxed than it ever was uh and I actually was really excited about the idea of just a higher end version of that um uh, you know with a, a a true endurance geometry uh, simple component fitments and just higher end components, higher end carbon fiber. That is actually a style of bike that I strongly believe is missing from the market at the moment. There's just not any like pure road endurance bikes on the market that hit a good weight. Yep. Absolutely agreed. And the fact that Canyon actually offers a version of the Endurance with the new Campy Super Record Wireless group set, mm-hmm. I and mean, that says a lot about where they feel like this bike, like, it has just such a broad range of appeal. Mm. That they go that it goes up that high in in spec, uh, and then it also goes down to I don't want to say at least one hundred five or Altegra Di two. I can't remember now, but it goes pretty far down in, in cost. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure how many people would want to buy a campy super record wireless bike where you can't adjust the stem length. Mm. Anyway, Canyon. It seems like a really good bike otherwise. Again, I was quite quite a big fan of it overall, uh, despite however many quirks it had. But yeah, this is something that needs to get fixed. All right, Dave, other thing I have in my mind, uh, you know, like people listening to this show, very familiar with the idea that you buy tools on a very, very regular basis. Yeah, uh, I guess. And 
every now and then, uh, I've had this idea that I kind of wanted to go shopping on AliExpress mm. to see if I could find some, uh, how should I describe this? Uh, questionable non-name brand products. Mm. Welcome to the Vog and Hunters Club. (laughs) Very, very highly discounted prices. Uh, So I did go on AliExpress the other day and I ended up buying some uh, suspension suspension top cap tools, uh, each of which Mm -hmm. were like four or five dollars, I think. Uh, I bought a chain dummy that was like four bucks that works on, uh, just works with your existing expensive one. I'm sure you could have found a cheap one than that. Uh, Maybe it was three. Okay. It was something like that. Yeah. But, but I also bought a, I'm sorry, specialized for anyone, any, any of you at that company listening to this, uh, I may have bought a specialized power knockoff. Oh. With carbon rails. What was it called? Uh, you know, I don't remember off the top of my head, hmm. but I do remember that it was $19. Wow. And, uh, I don't remember the weight off the top of my head. Uh, I don't have it with me. I, I don't, I don't think I wrote down the weight right now. Um, it's wicked light. And, uh, it is very much a power knockoff. This, the padding doesn't seem quite as good. It's definitely not mm. quite as firm, probably won't be quite as supportive. Um, I, uh, does it have an S logo on it? It doesn't really have any logos on it. As okay. a matter of fact, no, that's not bad. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely not like, it's very clearly not something that comes out of the same factory. Let's put it that yeah, way. Sure. So it's not like a saddle that like kind of got like pushed out the back door. Um, but very similar shape, uh, really, really light, carbon rails, carbon shell. Um, yeah, 20 bucks. Carbon I'm rails good. for 20 bucks. 20 bucks. And it's got a saddle on top of those rails. <laughs> it has a saddle on top of the rails. Wow. So what could go wrong, Dave? I don't know. I, I can tell you about some of my alley experiences <laughs> that have gone wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've bought quite a few things from AliExpress over the years. And in recent years, I've just bought, when I'm testing a category of tool, I'll, I'll actually buy what appears to be the most bought AliExpress version of it. And sometimes it's actually really good. Like uh, one of the standouts is a, a barb press tool from ZTTO, which is like a now very respectable brand on AliExpress, um, cycling brand. And their barb press tool um, is actually probably the best on the market. Oh, so I should have bought one um, of those too. And not expensive at all. And yeah, it, it honestly works better than like the Park Tool and even the Jaguar. Um, well, time for me to go shopping again. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are some good finds to be had, but I've also had like, I got a carbon fiber seat post once for my CAD 12. So it's a 25.4 millimeter diameter. So there's not a lot of options out there for that seat post. Um, and mounted up the saddle and immediately noticed that the the one side of the saddle sat lower than the <laughs> oh, other. <no. laughs> um, they they gave me a refund pretty quickly on that, but it just yeah, I mean, when something as simple as them not being able to drill a hole straight comes through, I yeah, I, I have my concerns about the safety on other on other aspects. But well, um yeah. I will say that if a saddle, shell, or rail fails out on a road ride, that's oftentimes not catastrophic. No. I'm probably not going to be buying a fork or a stem or a handlebar off of AliExpress. Yeah, unless it's got a a reputable brand name seller attached to it that has a a long history of existing, I'd say. Yeah, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But even then, I might think twice. Sure. But anyway... Uh, I'm kind of excited about this stuff because we talk all the time about how expensive bike stuff has gotten. And I agree. A lot of this stuff is just obscenely priced and it's priced to the point where normal people just can't afford to buy this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're looking at fancy high end 3D printed carbon saddles with carbon rails and everything. And they're like $450 now. And I'm not saying that that level of technology you can Shouldn't buy 22 of your saddles for that. <laughs> yeah. But when you look at something like that, that's $450. And you look at something that you can get on AliExpress for 20, there's some, there's some reconciling that needs to be done here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, I, I mean, I'm not going to justify that, that level of difference in price, but I would say there no, is, no, of course not. There remains to be value in a brand that you can trust, right? A brand that, you know, tomorrow and a year or Absolutely. Five years from now, we'll still be around, and that if something went wrong, you have someone to contact. Absolutely. Often and- locally, whereas AliExpress, I mean, to the AliExpress as a platform, to their credit, they're they're very good at providing 
warranties when it comes to a resolution. Um, and I know this because I've had to do it two or three times where the seller has completely refused to to replace a product that that was broken out of the packaging mm. in 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 two cases I'm thinking of. Uh, and the seller's like, "You've you know this is this is not our fault." Uh, and AliExpress has both times given me a, a refund. But but yeah, I mean that's that's the difference is you're you're often dealing with brands that can disappear overnight and just start up again under a different name and sell the same product and you'd never know. Whereas mm. when you're buying from a reputable, long-standing brand in the cycling industry, yes, you're paying a premium, but realistically you're paying for the, the trust that that brand brings. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that these higher end saddles should cost 20 bucks. Uh, I mean, they're even just holding this thing in my hand. It, it is very, very light, but the the quality is certainly not as good as as something that's I don't want to describe it as legitimate, but something from kind of like a mainstream established brand. Yeah. Um, but again, like it it just seems like there should be some sort of middle ground there anyway. Mm. Um, but either way, uh, I am actually looking forward to getting this saddle mounted up and trying it out on the road. And um, I think I'm probably going to do a full review on it at some point because you know I I feel like people need to know whether mm. this stuff's any good. Yeah. It reminds me, I, uh, last year I bought a pair of, I have a, a one of my most used pair of sunglasses, Oakley Sutro Lights. Uh, and I found um, the same glasses on AliExpress, a Sutro Light in the same color. And I bought them. Uh, and I've had to be very careful about keeping them separate because they're kind of hard to tell apart. Oh my. And I'm worried about accidentally mixing them up. Hmm. So, um, aesthetically they're a match. Uh, once you put them on, you're like, are the lenses dirty or are they just not very good? Um, <laughs> but yeah. Interesting. All right anyway. then. Yeah. So anyway, stay tuned. I'll have a report on that sooner than later. Uh, Dave, should we wrap up with the PSA here and then call it a night? Sure. Uh, this is a pretty quick one. Um, so one thing that occurred to me the other day, uh, when I was riding that Endurance, one thing that struck me was that uh, the free hub on that bike was just super, super, super quiet, like refreshingly so to the point where I was kind of like, oh, this is what it's like to ride a completely silent bike again. Um, but anyway, it got me thinking the fact that most people aren't really in the habit of checking the quality and the condition of their free hub body lube. Um, and I feel like a lot of people are riding hubs that are probably a lot louder and kind of more clackety than they maybe remember them being just because it's such a gradual transition over time. But uh, yeah, my, my PSA today is just to kind of get in there and do a, do a free hub body service. If you haven't done it in a long time, or if you can't remember how long it's been, um, I mean, partially it's just for a component wear, but also it could just kind of nicely quiet things down. Yeah. I'd say it's a very, very commonly neglected area of the bike. Cause it's, it's hidden. Um, I'd say generally speaking, um, Bike shops tend to neglect it too in services. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I've often seen that bikes that have been through a what you'd call a general service or even a, a deeper service that, that that part of the bike, if it's running smoothly from the outside, mechanics often won't open it up. Um, but what I'd recommend is, yeah, most free hub bodies are actually quite simple to service. Like especially DT Swiss, you don't need any, don't necessarily need any tools unless the end cap stuck um you can kind of just rip off the cassette and without even removing the cassette you can gain access to a lot of free hub bodies uh and yeah you want some light viscosity grease in there um but most importantly you you tend to end up um being able to access some of the 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 main bearings that are the the soonest to fail or soonest to wear and it lets you do quite a good uh, preventative maintenance in that area clean out the the seals of the bearings and add some fresh grease and away you go yeah and it literally is a five minute job in a lot of cases so yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and yeah I'll, I'll, I'd add that it's it's neglected because it's it's the susceptible part to degrease uh, entering into the hub system when people you know if you if you ever degrease your your chain with the rear wheel in place again i'd recommend using a dummy hub in place of that rear wheel for this very reason but yeah if you do degrease the chain with with the wheel installed then you're you're basically in most cases you're going to get some water entry and degreaser entry into into behind that seal behind the cassette and that's exactly where the the free hub body mechanism sits and then eventually bad things are going to happen mm-hmm So anyway, yeah, go ahead and get in there.
if you haven't done it in a long time. So that's my PSA for this week. Yeah. Um, one more thought on that. Oh, yep. not every free hub body is serviceable. A lot of Shimano hubs on the market. True. Most Shimano hubs are considered a sealed, non-serviceable unit. So, yeah, perhaps look up what your hub is and figure out how to do it and whether you can. I used to take those old free hub bodies and kind of just dribble in a bunch of like fill wood tenacious oil. It mm. took a while. Mm. It took a while for that grease to kind of, or for that oil just to kind of soak in there. You can get into them. It's it just, did work. It's just a lot of work to get into them. And patience. Anyway. So, all right, that's it for this week's show. Uh, just before we wrap up, just a quick reminder that this podcast, along with everything else that we do at the Escape Collective, is completely funded by our members. Big disc break. Did someone say big disc break? I think I heard big... Hmm. Anyway, everything at the Escape Collective is funded by our members, meaning there are no ads, aside from big disc break. Um, <laughs> no sponsored episodes. No questions for who we work for. Uh... If you like what you're hearing, you like what you're PTY LTD. Oh, God, dear God. If you like what you're hearing and seeing from us at the Escape Collective, please consider becoming a member if you haven't already signed up. You do get full access to all of our content, and full members also get to jump into the uh, really amazingly civil comment section that we have on the site. Excuse me. Uh, full members also get to jump into our members only Discord channel where our community talks about everything from, well, I don't know. We kind of talk about everything. Grease viscosities and uh, torque wrench recommendations. Tire selection. Tire selection. Everything. It's quite a lively bunch, actually. Yeah. Anyway, monthly subs start at just 7 bucks US per month. Uh, we've got discounted annual options and stuff. You can head over to escapecollective.com slash join for more info. If you haven't already joined, shame on you. Uh, if you have joined, thank you. Uh, if you haven't joined and you, have no, and you have no intention to, well... Okay, I get it. For for those of you, though, you can at least head over to iTunes.com and leave us a rating and review because that helps us out as well. So that's my that's my plea for this week. Okay. Anyway, thanks again for listening. As always, we'll be back next week with more, and we'll be back with the full crew. So we'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>